Hi, welcome. My name is Itama. I'm uh, the CTO and founder of Big Data Boutique. We are um, representing Elastic in, uh, in Israel. We do a lot of uh, consulting, training, and, and all of those kind of stuff, including production support and various solutions around Elasticsearch. Thank you for Doit, which are great partners uh, in the cloud area and uh, for Google for hosting. And uh, what we will do today is we'll have two talks around the meeting point of Elasticsearch and Kubernetes. So Kubernetes, I assume uh, all of you, if not, uh, most of you, if not all of you uh, are familiar with. How many of you are actually working with Kubernetes today? All right, pretty much all of you. Uh, how many of you are working with Elastic today? Pretty much all of you, which is a good point for us. Um, so the first talk, the one I will give, uh, is around running Elasticsearch on Kubernetes. The second talk, which Dov will, uh, will, will give, um, Dov uh, is working for Elastic, and he will give you a talk about how to um, use Elastic to monitor stuff, which is Kubernetes on its own and, and other things around that. Um, and that's pretty much it. Um, if you want to have any conversation around Elastic, um, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, us is me and the bar over there, the tall guy, um, and we'll be happy to, to assist. Uh, we have Elastic training at, uh, in Israel, which is also uh, next week. Uh, so feel free to reach out if you're interested. Um, so our agenda for today, at least for my talk here, um, is start with Kubernetes concept. So most of you are already <coughs> using Kubernetes. The, the, the ones who do not use Kubernetes, I assume know about Kubernetes, and maybe even uh, more details about it. But we'll start with actually giving laying some ground on Kubernetes to understand what it is, how to work with it, and specifically some features around it, which we will need in order to um, run Elasticsearch on Kubernetes. Then we'll talk a bit about Elasticsearch concepts, the, again, the ones that are important to understand how to run Elasticsearch on Kubernetes, and then we'll give some practical advice around that. So how to run it, how to size it, and, and things like that. So start, without further ado, um, Kubernetes is a co container orchestration platform, right? Um, you can take containers, and uh, which is our application, various services you want to run, and you will run them on Kubernetes. And the whole, the whole point of Kubernetes is to let, give you a good way of running that and running that in a scalable way, in, in a full tolerant way, uh, etc. And Kubernetes, in, in the end, is just a set of containers running in some way that you define. And the Kubernetes um, building blocks are essentially the container that you'll be running. And it will, be, it will run within a pod. A pod can contain multiple containers, but let's just assume one container per pod. And then that pod, you're going to deploy it in some way, in, some, in a certain amount of replicas on the Kubernetes cluster, which we, which we will see in a second. And that um, deployment uh, here written as a deployment, but it, it can come in various flavors. Right, so the, the idea is to take, take the container and to control how it is deployed on the cluster. Once, once you've deployed a container, sometimes for some services, for example, a web application, you would want to expose it to the web or to other services. And this is where you will use the Kubernetes service, which essentially will expose some IP or some address that you can, you can communicate uh, with that container, with that application. So that whole thing here is going to be deployed on a Kubernetes cluster. So you're going to have multiple servers, hosts, running uh, Kubernetes, and that is going to be your Kubernetes cluster. There is a master, a Kubernetes master somewhere to manage all of those deployments, but those Kubernetes hosts are going to run your containers, your deployments, and, and the services are going to expose them for traffic, etc. So that green uh, bullet, that green uh, square over there is going to be a deployment. And obviously you can scale that and have multiple replicas of that deployment. And the idea is to run as many containers, as many applications, as many services as you would need for any sort of application. And that is going to scale across your Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes hosts, Kubernetes cluster. Now, notice how those two green uh, squares which are just one service, a specific service, 
application is running with two replicas, two copies of it running on the same host. If that host will go down, your application will go down, or at least that specific part of your application. So the idea is to be able to scale or uh, to replicate those containers, those applications or the replicas of an application in a way that will prevent it from going down when a host, a single host goes down. And this is what we call affinity or anti-affinity. In that case, you, are, you can tell Kubernetes that those applications need to run side by side with other applications or some containers need to run on a host that doesn't already run that specific container, that specific application. So this is just one of the ways that you can tell Kubernetes how your application looks like and tell it exactly how to run it across nodes and to achieve uh, high availability, fault uh, tolerance, uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So we'll talk about this in, in just a few moments, but Kubernetes was initially designed and initially implemented for a ephemeral workload. So you just run a, an application and if that <coughs> container, that pod, goes down, nothing bad really happened. And this is why the, the default storage for a, a, a application or container running on Kubernetes is going to be the storage within that container. It, in some points, you can even use the host storage, the, ho the storage that ho the host gives you. But again, if a host goes down, if a container, a pod goes down, you practically lose uh, lose the data that you stored. So Kubernetes allows you, uh, it exposes some abstraction that lets you create a persistent volume. So it uh, depends on which cloud or which environment you're going to run your Kubernetes cluster on, you get a way of telling uh, Kubernetes, I need this volume to be available to me. And what if, even if one host goes down, when another host will go up and that pod will just move shift to that other host, I still can have that persi persistent volume by using what we call a persistent volume claim. So my application can define on, or can be attached to a persistent volume claim, and that persistent volume claim will basically tell Kubernetes, I want to have a, this storage, that specific storage, um, and even if a container goes down, I can still uh, get it back from even from another a different host. So all of those concepts are going to tie together uh, within a stateful stateful set. So a stateful set is just a sort of deployment. It's just a deployment like we uh, discussed before. So uh, a container running within a pod with some, some replicas, etc. But a stateful set uh, allows you to use that persistent volumes and persistent volume claims. And it, it, is, uh, it allows you to actually give an identity to a pod, to a container running within a pod. And then, again, even if one host goes down, that specific node, that very same pod, very same um, node, uh, if you will, of Elastic, which we'll discuss in a minute, it is going to uh, be brought up again on whatever host, but it is going to be that, that same, exactly same uh, specific application or with this exact same state as it had, but on even even if it's on another host, um, there is another concept that's called a headless service. And whenever you use a stateful set, headless service, which is just like a, a different a, a standard service, just just like we described, uh, described before. But it is good, it is a specific service that is aimed to allow discovery uh, to happen for stateful set pods. And that brings us to the Elastic Stack. So um, again, most of you are already familiar with Elastic Stack, so you may have seen this graph or a similar graph before, but the Elastic Stack today is a broad set of products, right? So you can use it for full text search, you can use it for uh, monitoring, for real-time BI, for many uh, such use cases, but in the end, that layer in the middle, Elasticsearch, this is the service that actually, or the part of the stack that is actually going to have all of, the, all of your data. This is where your data is going to be persisted, where queries are going to run. This is like the, uh, the actual meat of, of the entire stack. And then you have many, uh, many other components. So Kibana is some sort of a, of a UI, okay? mostly used for aggregations, but can also be used for search. So um, 
Uh, Kibana is sort of a UI and a management UI also for Elasticsearch. And, and you have the bits and logs dash, which are the ETL tools, right? The tools or the services or the applications that you can use to put data into Elasticsearch from various uh, data sources and for whatever reasons. So what we are going to do now is to tie what I just described on Kubernetes for the Elastic Stack, but more specifically for Elasticsearch, for that part in the middle, which is actually the data layer, if you will, uh, for Elastic, for the Elastic Stack. Um, running Kibana and Beats and Logstash is, is really, it's not too difficult to do. The things that I want to touch on are specific to the, again, the state that Elastic and Elasticsearch need, need to persist. Before I do that, I want to have uh, to talk about this slide for a second, and that's an important discussion we, we really need to have. So um, I just started and talked about uh, running uh, Elasticsearch on Kubernetes. The question is, do you actually want to do that? Right? And, and this is a discussion I think we ought to have. So um, obviously, if your entire application, entire system, entire uh, company runs on Kubernetes and just Kubernetes, Obviously, it's very compelling to run Elasticsearch on Kubernetes because, well, just, you know, another, the same way that you deploy everything, you're going to deploy your Elasticsearch and probably your database somewhere and, and other stateful services as well. And that's a completely valid point. Uh, obviously, and even, even more to that, if you have a software system that is going to be deployed on, on a cloud somewhere as, as SaaS, right? SaaS, some SaaS offering, but you also uh, should be able to take that um, deployment and deploy, deploy it on premises, on customer sites, okay? So this is going to simplify your entire process in a great, in a great deal, right? So instead of having multiple ways of deploying stuff and, and SaaS is going to, to be deployed this way and, and on-prem is going to be deployed that the other way, just have single Kubernetes deployment, you deploy it once on the cloud, whichever cloud, um, and once on, on your you know, kind of customers' VMs or hosts or whatever. Um, and, and this is a, 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 a really good reason for doing that. Um, out of the box, once you've done that, you also get things like uh, uh, running updates and recovery and in many features that Kubernetes can provide to you out of the box without doing much. And, and it's a really, it can be a game changer for many companies. However, running databases on Kubernetes, especially if there are a lot, huge databases, databases in general, and in Elasticsearch specifically, uh, they, they do have some resource waste, right? So because, because you're running on some sort of an abstraction that runs on top of Kubernetes, and because Kubernetes was initially designed to run um, stateless service, services, right? So just applications without much state, if, if at all. Um, this is why Kubernetes is, was not designed to run databases. And, and if you're running huge clusters, you will see that in a moment. You have to make a lot of decisions around how you deploy Elastic or any database on your Kubernetes cluster. Um, so poles are, you know, um, reside with one another and, and, and to maintain all of those failure scenarios. So it's it's going to be some sort of a waste and probably also requires some work from you. So I would, if, if like the reasons I mentioned before are not exactly your use case, I would consider twice uh, before using Kubernetes uh, for any database and Elasticsearch is no, is no different. Um, so if you do decide to, dis to deploy Elasticsearch on Kubernetes, um, the easiest way for you to do that is just to take the Helm charts. So Helm is the package manager for, uh, for uh, Kubernetes. You can just take the, a, some Helm chart and, and deploy Elastic via that Helm chart. It's probably going to be the easiest way you can do that. So there is a stable uh, Elasticsearch Helm chart in the official Helm charts uh, Git repository and, and in the Helm charts uh, repository. Uh, there is also one that's being built currently and maintained by Elastic, the, the company behind Elasticsearch. Uh, it's currently on alpha stage, so um, your mileage may vary. Uh, it does look good, it does work, but it, it, they, they themselves define it as an alpha stage, so uh, take that into consideration. Either way, um, what we're going to do now is just basically describe what those hand charts are going to do. 
see some uh, pitfalls that you may see during uh, running Elasticsearch on Kubernetes. And I'll also give you the tools to, to just run this on your own if you don't want to use one of those ham charts and you just want to uh, write the YAMLs yourself. Either way, whatever you do, if you have um, Elasticsearch nodes that you need to use custom plugins of, of some, some sort, some analyzers or, or whatever, uh, you will need to, uh, to create the containers yourself. Right? So you cannot use the official ones. You have to um, take them and write a Docker file that installs that plugin and then use that, obviously. So what is the um, autonomy of uh, anatomy, sorry, of, uh, of Elasticsearch? Um, how many of you have heard about master nodes, data nodes? How many of you are actually uh, employing that separation? Okay, so half, half the room. So it's probably a good idea to, to reiterate that a bit. Um, so Elasticsearch has some several roles that each node, each Elasticsearch node can have. An Elasticsearch node is essentially a server, a host, but since we're talking Kubernetes, um, that's just going to be a pod. And that specific node can have multiple roles. And when you launch Elasticsearch locally or on the cloud, it is going to have all of those roles at once. And it's probably not a good idea, it's definitely not a good idea to do that um, in production in, or in clusters that require um, some, to do some heavy lifting. So we usually separate um, data from master and in some cases also master, master and data from client nodes. So data nodes is the nodes that will contain your data. Those are the actual um, nodes that we, you will need to have state for that you're going to uh, somehow manage their data and, and give them all of the resources or most of the resources <coughs> that you can have. Master nodes are nodes that do not require much resources most, uh, in most cases. And those nodes are going to just uh, maintain the cluster or manage the cluster. Um, we'll see that in action in, in just a few, uh, a few minutes. And they also decide on, on the quorum, or on the um, state that the Elasticsearch cluster need, needs to maintain. So separating master and data is, is absolutely a must, and, and we'll see the topology in just a few minutes. Um, and client nodes are nodes, or they're also called coordinating nodes. Those are nodes that you'll deploy to your cluster to, lever to just take out some CPU from data nodes and be able to just scale in and out uh, some nodes of your cluster that uh, handle communication with clients and, and query execution to some extent and, and things like that. And it basically allows you to give data nodes more power, right? So instead of using, um, I don't know, eight cores and 64 gigabytes of uh, memory um, on data nodes to do both uh, indexing, searching, and also communication with with uh, uh, with clients, client web applications, or applications in general, you'll uh, delegate those resources to a client node. So you'll deploy some several client nodes, and client nodes will act in, uh, on doing all of that instead of doing this, uh, letting the data nodes do that. And then the data nodes just can have more power. They can use the resources specifically for what they were designed for, which is querying, indexing, uh, and things like that. So a topology, a, an Elasticsearch cluster topology, will uh, ideally look like that, right? So you can you can avoid the client nodes if a cluster is very small and you and you want. You can just have uh, data nodes act as client nodes. And as you can see here, your applications are going to talk with the client nodes. Either they are separate or they are just part of your master nodes. I don't think you can see that clearly. But the arrows pointing at the master nodes are, are in gray, right? So they are not the main, uh, main point of communication. Data does not go through those arrows. So um, many people believe that master nodes are the ones that accept the query and then submit that to the data nodes. That's not what's actually going to happen. Um, your application will submit the query or indexing operation, whatever operation, to the cluster to the coordinating node, either it's a separate client node, standalone client node, or it's uh, data nodes acting as client nodes, and the data nodes will communicate between themselves. The only thing that masters are going to do uh, within the cluster itself is managing the cluster. So 
basically metadata, not data itself. The data will never reach uh, <coughs> master nodes, but uh, just metadata and the master nodes will manage all of that. In terms of sizing, how many nodes you want to have for each? So master nodes, you will always have exactly three. In some rare scenarios, you want to have more, uh, mainly for reasons of availability zones. But you, in most clusters that we see, there is no reason to have more, more than three uh, master nodes. Definitely not below uh, three master nodes. Having less than three master nodes basically is a broken cluster. All right? if, if, it, if it's one master node, it basically means that your master can go down, your entire cluster can become read-only. Uh, that's not something that you, you probably, it's not something that you want. And data nodes is at least two servers, right? You, you want to be able to make sure that you have enough nodes, enough hosts to replicate the, your data to and to uh, avoid um, uh, for fair scenarios. And like I said, client nodes is uh, d depending on your scenario, whether you want that or not. If you do have client nodes, just make sure you have enough to handle the load and to make sure that if one client node crashes, uh, being removed, whatever, you still have enough client nodes remaining. So this is a typical cluster topology. How big each node is going to, uh, to be, I'm not really going to discuss that, but I'll give you some pointers uh, in just a few slides. Um, and this is a typical Elasticsearch cluster topology on whatever environment. On Kubernetes, it will basically look like that. So each data node uh, just got a number because like I said, when we deploy, we are going to use stateful sets and that will give each data node its own unique ID and that ID is going to be persisted uh, uh, along, along the cluster life. And now I also attached a persistent volume and a persistent volume claim to each of those nodes. So the stateful set is going to run on top of pers uh, Kubernetes persistent volumes. And that basically go guarantees that if one of the data nodes is going to be removed, crushed, again, whatever, when that data node uh, goes back to life, it has all of its data uh, readily available. Master nodes uh, can be deployed as stateful sets as well. They can also be deployed as, uh, as just a uh, simple deployment. It doesn't really matter. Um, state, deploying that as stateful sets just uh, uh, ensures that the, when the master goes up, it, has all, it already has the master metadata available to it on storage, which, which is cool, but definitely not a must. And client nodes, again, they do not have any state and they can, can, they can just be launched as simple deployments. Like I mentioned before, Kibana, Logstash, Beats, um, any other type of applications for Cerebro, whatever, can just be deployed as simple deployments, again, no state whatsoever. And they are going to be talking with the lo some load balancer service, uh, a Kubernetes service, that I'm going to uh, put in front of the client nodes. Again, we're not going to talk directly with master nodes, that never happens. We're going to uh, attach a service of type load balancer, type cluster IP, doesn't really matter, to a to the coordinating nodes or to the client nodes um, if they are deployed separately to them. Uh, otherwise, obviously, we'll, just, we'll talk directly with the data nodes through that uh, service. Um, this is how an Elasticsearch cluster is going to look like um, in general and specifically with some Kubernetes uh, points. And once you deploy that on a Kubernetes cluster, like we've seen before, you would want to enforce some, some, uh, some sense of, uh, of anti-affinity, which will make sure that data nodes, <coughs> the actual pods now, are not going to run on the same host unless you, you explicitly want that to happen. And also we want, and this is like the part where we get into availability zones, right? So um, when you deploy a cluster you, uh, or any database, you basically want to have some sense of availability zones to make sure that if one host goes down or, or something happens, you still have other parts of your system as completely function. So Kubernetes obviously supports that notion of multi-zone and you can just leverage that, obviously. Um, and you can put an anti-affinity uh, rule on your cluster, a simple one, for small clusters, it probably, it's probably going to be enough. And then you can also use the Elasticsearch Rack Awareness on top of that. And how many of you have heard of Elasticsearch Rack Awareness? All right. So Elasticsearch Rack Awareness basically tells Elasticsearch, um, this node 
um, is running on a specific hardware or is it runs on a specific availability zone uh, by hardware, I mean hostname or, or rack ID or something like that. And then Elasticsearch is smart enough to just lift and shift shards or indexes uh, based on that. So Elasticsearch can ensure, if you just tell it uh, to do that, it can ensure that there are no indexes or no replicas of an index sitting on the same uh, rack or, or host name based on what you tell it. So um, just look it up, Elasticsearch Rack Awareness, it's a very simple API. When you launch a node, you give it a hardware identifier, rack identifier, host identifier, whatever, and then you can tell Elasticsearch with a simple API call to just enable rack awareness, and, and Elasticsearch will do that. <coughs> and this is going to be useful for large clusters on Kubernetes, because on large clusters, you are probably going to have big machines, and then you just want to have uh, smaller, but still big, but smaller data nodes and multiple data nodes on per host. If you have large clusters, this is probably how you're going to use your hardware the best. And Elasticsearch Track Awareness is going to help you with that. It's also going to help you uh, with the concept of availability zones by basically uh, propagating that, that notion of availability zone into, into Elasticsearch. Um, whatever happens, um, I'm mentioning it even though it doesn't have much connection to Kubernetes, because Kubernetes will not span across geographic, uh, different geographic zones or regions, how the way we call them. But this is something we see happen uh, too much, not too, not a lot, but too much. Um, a lot of people try to uh, deploy Elasticsearch clusters uh, that span geographic regions. So one cluster that runs on both US East One and uh, US West Two, and, and this is this is not the way you should run Elasticsearch. Um, and even though Kubernetes does not support that out of the box multi-region uh, clusters, or, or at least not through just through federation. Um, what you should do if you want to have geographic redundancy is use uh, either do that uh, via some sort of, uh, of infrastructure like Kafka and stuff like that, or use the Elasticsearch feature, which is relatively new, cross-cluster replication, which is cluster aware, and it allows you to replicate data across geographic regions. Do not just try to span a cluster uh, yourself. In terms of resources allocation, um, again, uh, that's just a, a topic for a, a full hour of, uh, of, uh, of session, but sizing an Elasticsearch cluster which that runs on Kubernetes is really no different from sizing it and you know, realizing the sizes for um, Elasticsearch cluster running on, on bare, bare metal or uh, VMs, just the same. A node is a node. We have we have some rules of thumb to understand sizing and where, where we should start, but any sizing operation uh, for significant clusters really need to be run um, specifically for your data, specifically for your queries, for the KPIs that you want to measure. Um, what I can tell you is that there are some measures that you need to take into account. So uh, memory, a lot of people using Elasticsearch for a while, they put a lot of, uh, of uh, uh, they look really closely into how much memory they give the, uh, the JVM, right? The heap size, yes, heap size. Um, recent or modern versions of Elasticsearch actually really care also a lot about the memory that is off heap. So if you have 64 gigabytes of memory in your data node, it's not, uh, it's not a fact that you need to give it 50% or, or, or 20 gigs or, or anything like that. A lot, in a lot of clusters, actually giving it just 10, 10, gig, 10 gigabytes of memory to the heap size and leaving 50 gigabytes to, uh, to the system cache and, and machine and, and everything else is going to be very, very, very effective. Right? So for example, in systems running <coughs> aggregations in full scale, there's going to be a drastic performance improvement if you actually use 10 gigabytes of heap size as opposed to 30, 50%. So this is just one, uh, one tip I can give you. Um, CPU, the, the amount of CPU that you request from Kubernetes. So um, you actually need to request that and Elasticsearch then sees how many cores it's running on. And this is going to, be co to, con to control um, the amount of threads that Elasticsearch dedicates to a lot of the operations. So search operations, indexing operations, a lot of that. So it's really important 
um, and pay attention to the amount of CPU that you request uh, from Kubernetes for your nodes. Also, for many, many workloads, Elasticsearch really, really favors um, SSD, right? So SSD storage class, as opposed to just, just HDD, um, it's, it's going to be dramatic improvement for your indexing and for many operations that uh, in Elastic that require disk, which are also on the read side, so aggregations, for example, and, and things like that. Um, in terms of scaling, um, so one question we get a lot is about auto-scaling. So the short answer is don't do it. Um, the longer answer is, uh, is going as follows. Master nodes never scale, right? So exactly three master nodes, just in very, very rare scenarios, we'll have more than three master nodes, but other than that, exactly three master nodes for every cluster. Um, data nodes, um, you can scale them up very easily. Just pay attention that, to, the point, to the fact that when you add data nodes, Elasticsearch will try to balance <coughs> right, the, the amount of shards, the indexes that you have. So it will cause some IO, be careful of that. Um, but scaling up is very easy. Scaling down it, with Kubernetes, it's, it's easy enough, right? You can just bring down nodes, it's okay. Again, we are using stateful services and I'm assuming you're replicated on your cluster, so it's okay. Um, just make sure that when you do that, um, it's probably better if you just tell Elasticsearch that you're removing a node before you actually do that. You can use index tagging for that, you can just add a tag uh, and, and basically retire a node. Tell Elasticsearch that this node is going down and you move all of the shards out of it. Better if you do this before you bring down the node, but it's okay. Um, and again, with, uh, with Kubernetes it's really done uh, easily. The, my point about, about auto-scaling is just I don't like, you know, things scaling automatically without proper testing. And uh, even though, for example, on client nodes, I would maybe recommend doing auto scaling by watching some metrics. So how busy that client node is, if it's just client node or just not <coughs> data node, if it's dedicated client node, I might scale it, auto scale it, but then I will only auto scale it up and I will never auto scale down. And I would prefer scaling down manually and not scaling down automatically, but client nodes is something that I will maybe auto scale up. Um, data nodes, because again, they're maintaining state and, and adding more nodes will cause some rebalance on the cluster, which we'll discuss in just a few seconds. I would prefer not to do auto scale. Again, this is my advice and your mileage can vary. Another thing um, uh, that happens a lot lately with Elasticsearch is more complex architectures. So a hot, warm, cold architecture, when you have uh, one single cluster, big cluster maybe, um, and then uh, some nodes that run on very strong hardware, and then uh, other nodes that run on maybe weaker hardware, maybe same hardware, but then the storage density goes up, uh, you basically put a lot more data on the same hardware. And this is architecture that actually happens a lot. And it's very easy to do with Kubernetes, again, uh, with, with some tagging and with proper, uh, a proper way of doing that. I will probably use different stateful sets for that, uh, for that architecture. Um, and then comes the question, how do we actually use the Kubernetes approach for rolling updates. Um, so Elasticsearch actually supports rolling updates out of the box on its nodes. So if you are running on, let's say, version 6, 6.4, for example, you want, you want to upgrade to the recent 6.7, which was just released a few days ago, um, you can easily do that. All you have to do is just deploy new nodes or, or update node in place. A, a single Elasticsearch cluster can run multiple versions, two versions, two minor versions of the same major version in the same cluster. So 6.4 can freely speak to 6.7, and uh, what, what actually happens is also that you can run 6.7 with 7, right? So the last major, last minor version of each major can talk with the next major. So running updates in Elasticsearch is basically um, uh, supported out of the box. And all we have to do is just update the image on Kubernetes, and Kubernetes will do that for you. It will update one pod at a time, uh, really, how we say, easy peasy. Uh, just two things to note. Um, because we have three different deployments, right? We have masters, we have datas, we have clients. 
So we'll have to update them one after another. I will not do that on the same time. And so what we usually do, we update masters. We see that everything went smoothly. Uh, we go and update all the <coughs> datas. And in the end, we just update the, the clients. And before we do that, there is a guy that put the link for that uh, by Elasticsearch, how to do running cluster update. It basically uh, kind of locks your data. It makes sure that data doesn't shift around between nodes during those restarts. And it's something I really highly recommend of doing. So just follow that. It's, it's a really simple to follow guide. We're a bit short of time, so I put some nitty-gritty details of, of how and you know, the small things that you really need to pay attention to uh, when you uh, deploy Elasticsearch or Kubernetes. We will make those slides available to you, so you can see, you'll see that later. Um, and just, just two, three uh, last points. So um, index lifecycle management, uh, and that title relates to the hot one called architecture that I discussed uh, just a few seconds before, um, is something that Elastic really pays uh, a lot of uh, attention to lately. Uh, uh, starting with 6.6, .6, you actually can manage the index lifecycle from within Kibana. Index lifecycle basically means uh, you know, I have this cluster, it has hot, warm, and cold nodes. Um, there is something called a new that's called frozen indexes, which are indexes that you can run queries on, and do, they do not put any pressure on memory. So queries run a lot slower, but they do not require any memory whatsoever, which is really, uh, really good for very old indexes. So that, that decay uh, approach of having one very hot index that I'm querying frequently, and then a month passes and I query it less. So that, that workload that is very, is very common with Elastic, you can manage that decay of, of availability directly from Elastic. And you can also use Curator, which is a product by Elastic, uh, to automate that if you're not on 6.6. On um, and obviously backups. So we have that in the last slide, but basically backups in Elastic are very, very cheap to have. So <laughs> performing snapshots of your data is something you really want to have very frequently, and you can automate that, again, also with the creator. Um, monitoring. Uh, expert monitoring, which is uh, just built in with any recent Elasticsearch version, will give you pretty much everything you need. Um, oftentimes, we put Grafana on top of that to just visualize multiple nodes at the same graph, but that's something you can achieve with Elastic as well. Um, and the hotspots to monitor really are Elasticsearch nodes. Just look at the load average, you'll see which node is you know, uh, working too hard. And then on the JVM side, just monitor GC counts and time. That will give you a good indication of, uh, of again, if a node works hard, uh, why. Um, it, it will usually be a, J a GC. Um, and on the, last, the Elasticsearch side, have a look on the thread pools, how many of them are busy and, and, and maybe have been reje rejected um, uh, tasks, <coughs> and then caches, evictions, and, and how many merges ha are happening. So those are the metrics we usually start with, and, and that gives, you, gives us a good idea of how our lab cluster looks like. Um, I briefly mentioned that we are able to run Elasticsearch clusters on Kubernetes clusters that running on preemptible or spot instances. That's quite easy to do with stateful sets and, and Kubernetes if you do this correctly. So one of, one of the tricks is to use a uh, in this case, in this case a JKE so uh, preemptible nodes killer. So instead of just waiting for a node to go down to be killed by Google, uh, we will kill that ourselves with some uh, some pod that someone wrote, and then we are able to make sure that. Uh, there are no multiple hosts of Kubernetes hosts that just go down at the same time. Um, some friendly production advice, and, and we'll finish by that. So um, things for, for those of you who have used Elasticsearch before, you probably know uh, a couple of advices which are not much relevant anymore. So for example, um, a lot of uh, emphasis has been put on how many shards you have per index. Um, today, uh, on modern Elasticsearch versions, we do not shard on indexes, so we will not have many shards per index in most cases. Uh, today we'll use other mechanisms for, for, so for example, we'll shard on an index level. So we'll have multiple indexes instead of multiple shards for one index. And just to, just to name 
a few ways of doing that is time-based indexes, which you probably are familiar with, and the rollover API, which allows you to just switch indexes as you go along and basically do some sort of auto sharding and things like that. Um, I do recommend on critical production clusters to disable shard allocation and shard rebalance, at least to some extent. That will give you the stability that you want, even if you know a host goes down and things like that. Um, the, your cluster will not just start rebalancing, and it will be much more stable. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, I'm, I'm, I'll, be, I'll be rather be awakened once a month uh, at night, in the middle of the night, just to find out uh, that a, an index wasn't really initialized, and I'll just unlock the shard rebalancing, make it happen, and go back to sleep, then have slowness in production critical clusters uh, every other night. And then, like I said, Elasticsearch Backup, so the way they call it snapshots, are really, really cheap, so you should really use them uh, as much as possible. So that was me. I'm a bit out of time, so um, I'll take questions in a break. Uh, we have 10 minutes break now. Um, find us and, and, and those links are in my blog, on Twitter, or whatever. I uh, will be happy to answer any Elasticsearch questions, give you, um, and maybe tell us about our offerings around Elasticsearch. <coughs> we'll be happy to do that. Um, any of you interested in Elasticsearch training happening next week, just talk to us uh, in the break. Thank you. 10 minutes, and then Dov uh, about Kubernetes Smart Monitoring.